So it's with great pleasure today that I welcome my good friend and fellow earthworm enthusiast, Kerry Calloway. And she's not going to talk about any modern research or not a lot of modern research. She's going to take a journey this Darwin day into the past and tell us all about Darwin's earthworms uh, and the groundbreaking soil ecology research that he undertook. So over to you, Kerry. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, so thank you um, for inviting me here today um, to talk about Darwin uh, on what is Darwin Day. Um, so uh, it would have been his 215th birthday today um, if he was still alive. So it's really exciting um, that so many people are here tonight um, to learn a little bit more about Darwin uh, and about um, all of the work that he did with earthworms. Uh, so I'm going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes, hopefully not too much longer. Um, and I'll go through a little bit of the um, history of earthworm science, um, Charles Darwin's um, life, and then um, in some detail, some of the experiments that he did with earthworms. Uh, and then we'll kind of finish up looking at um, the book that he published uh, and one of his final experiments. Um, and then there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, so just a quick introduction uh, to me. Uh, my name's Kerry uh, Calloway and I'm the secretary and uh, recorder um, and tutor for the Earthworm Society of Britain. Um, so I used to be um, found in my earthworm time out in the field, uh, digging up earthworms, um, running a lot of um, earthworm ID courses, uh, teaching people how to identify earthworms, teaching them different sampling techniques as well. Um, but a couple of years ago, uh, I moved out of the UK, uh, moved to Ghana, uh, and uh, so I'm not doing any earthworm recording here, um, but have been fortunate to be able to keep doing some earthworm um, work. And for the last couple of years, I've been working on a historical records project, um, kind of going through historical publications and museum collections to gather earthworm data and information um, from those. Uh, and I think um, Kieran will pop a link in the chat um, to a short talk I did um, a couple of months ago about that project, if anyone's interested. Um, so just a quick introduction to earthworms as well. Um, Hopefully everybody on the call has seen an earthworm before and kind of vaguely knows what one is. Um, they are in the phylum Annelida, um, so they are segmented uh, worm-shaped animals. Um, the taxonomy um, changes and changed quite recently. Um, so a couple of years ago, a new paper was published um, that uh, said that um, earthworms uh, fit into the order Crassiclitolata. So they identified this new order. Um, and within that, there's about 20 families of earthworms found around the world, uh, three that are found in the UK, um, but almost all of the species that we find in the UK belong to one family, um, the Lumbricidae. Uh, as I kind of go through the talk, I'm going to probably keep mentioning that earthworms are really important. Um, so I just wanted to um, actually talk a little bit about why they're important. Um, they are ecosystem engineers uh, and they are essential for soils, um, certainly in temperate, temperate regions of the world. Um, and they provide lots of different services to soils, um, to the ecosystem and to the environment. Um, so they work as nature's recycler. Um, so they're decomposers, uh, which means that they're feeding on um, dead and decaying uh, organic uh, matter. So most of the time that's dead plants. Um, or soil, depending on what species of earthworm we're talking about. Uh, and they're breaking down um, those um, the matter that they're eating uh, and recycling the nutrients from it, um, converting them back into nutrients that can be used by other organisms and by plants. Um, they're also really good at draining and aerating soil. Um, so a lot of earthworms make burrows um, through the soil, uh, and this is really important for helping to decompact the soil, uh, keep it nice and loose and aerated uh, and allow water to drain away when it rains. Um, they act as nature's plough, um, so they're churning the soil, mixing it up, um, bringing soil from quite deep down uh, up to the surface and also taking um, leaf litter, um, dead plants and things, and also soil from the surface deeper down into the soil. And I'll talk much more about that. And Darwin did lots of kind of observations and experiments to do with to do with them being nature's plough. Uh, they also act as a burial service. So they cause uh, they, they help to bury things or cause things to be buried in the soil. Uh, and then another really, really important um, service that they provide is food. Um, I'm sure we've all seen birds uh, 
eating an earthworm. Um, but they're really, really important uh, and nutritious food source for many, many, many different animals. Um, so I just want to go through a little bit of the kind of history of earthworm science. Um, and this is so that we're kind of uh, aware of what was known uh, and what Darwin would have known um, kind of at the start of his, his earthworm um, journey. Uh, so back in the fourth century, so two and a half thousand years ago, sorry, fourth century BC, uh, Aristotle uh, described earthworms as the entrails or intestines of the earth. Uh, and then just over 2000 years ago, uh, Cleopatra in ancient Egypt apparently, apparently established some laws to protect earthworms. Um, so even back thousands of years ago, people obviously knew that earthworms were really, really important. Uh, I'm not sure quite how they knew they were important or if they knew why they were important, um, but it seems that it seems that people uh, did certainly know that earthworms are important for um, ecosystems and for the environment. Uh, and then in 1758, uh, Linnaeus described the first earthworm species um, which, well, to Western science, which was Lumbricus terrestris. Um, so Linnaeus was a taxonomist um, working mainly in Sweden, um, and he kind of invented or created um, the classification system that is still used nowadays by scientists um, of describing organisms and giving them a name and grouping them um, based on their relatedness to other, other organisms. Uh, and so the first earthworm to be described was Lumbricus terrestris, um, which is a reasonably common uh, and very widespread earthworm. Um, it's native to Europe uh, and is quite a common species found in the UK. Um, it's probably nowadays found uh, almost all over the world as well. Um, but certainly, certainly a, an important species um, in the UK, and that was the first one to be described. <laughs> And then in 1777, uh, Gilbert White uh, wrote um, a, it was kind of a collection of um, letters um, to various people um, that was then put together and published um, as the natural history of Selborne. Um, so Selborne is a village in Hampshire where Gilbert White lived. Uh, and he spent um, a lot of time just kind of observing nature. Um, so animals, plants, um, how they interacted, what they did, how things uh, grew and changed and how animals changed behavior throughout the different seasons through the year. He just made lots and lots of observations and wrote about all sorts of um, different different groups of animals and plants. Um, in, in this book, he only mentions earthworms twice, unfortunately, uh, and doesn't go into very much detail, doesn't really do any kind of studies into earthworms. Um, but he does mention that though in appearance a small and despicable link in the chain of nature, yet if lost would make a lamentable chasm. So again, he clearly understands or is aware that earthworms are really, really important. Uh, and also in his book, um, he wrote that a good monography of worms would afford much entertainment and information and would open a large and new field in natural history. So he was kind of really calling for somebody to spend a lot of time researching earthworms uh, and write and write a book about them. And he thought that there was a lot of um, need and interest for that. And then in 1826, uh, Savigny, who was a French uh, scientist, um, described lots, lots more species of earthworm um, to science. Um, several of those are um, species that are regularly found uh, in the UK. Uh, so this leads us on to Charles Darwin, uh, who was born on the 12th of February, 1809. Um, and he uh, went off to uh, study medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he didn't really enjoy that. So then he went to the University of Cambridge to study natural theology, uh, and he enjoyed that a bit more. Uh, and whilst there, he met uh, Professor Henslow, who was a very important um, botanist at the time. Uh, and it was Henslow that kind of suggested that Darwin um, should go on the voyage of the Beagle, um, which was a voyage that was due to set sail um, to go to South America um, and to kind of map the coastline of South America. So Darwin set off on this voyage. Um, so this is kind of I guess what most people will know Charles Darwin for. Um, he set up on this set off on the voyage in 1831. Um, they spent a long time going up and down um, the coast of South America. He spent a lot of time in the Galapagos Islands um, observing different animals there. 
Uh, and then they also um, traveled all the way around the world as well. So it wasn't just South America that they went to. Uh, they were meant to be away for two years and ended up being away for about five years. Um, so it's quite a long, long journey. Um, he arrived back in the UK in 1836. Uh, and then the following year, 1837, uh, Darwin published his first paper on earthworms. Uh, and I'll talk um, in more detail in a moment about what was in that paper. Um, in 1839, uh, he married his cousin, Emma Wedgwood, uh, and they moved to Down House uh, in Kent in 1842. Uh, and it was in Down House that they then lived for the rest of their lives. Um, and Darwin did most of his earthworm experiments and observations in the gardens um, at Down House. Uh, and so that is now um, a museum um, that's dedicated to, to Darwin. Um, and you can go and see um, see the gardens uh, and and learn about a bit more about some of the experiments that he did, particularly with earthworms. Uh, in 1859, he published his um, book on the origin of species. So that's kind of what he's most famous for nowadays. Um, and in 1881, so 44 years after his first paper on earthworms, uh, he published The Formation of Vegetable Mould Through the Action of Worms. Uh, and so this was his book all about um, all of the work he had done on earthworms. Um, it's over a hundred years after Gilbert White um, had initially kind of called for somebody to write a book about earthworms and no one no one else had done the work in the meantime. Um, so Darwin was the first one. Uh, and then um, just a year after the book was published, uh, he died in 1882. <laughs> um, so the first, the first paper that Darwin wrote uh, was called On the Formation of Mould. Um, and he, so this is um, just the year after returning from the Beagle, uh, and he went to visit his uncle, um, Josiah Wedgwood, who's in the picture, and he lived in Staffordshire. Um, and he took Darwin to um, a field <clears throat> nearby um, that um, farmers had laid or um, put kind of lime and cinder on the surface of this field um, about 10 years before. Uh, and farmers did this to help fertilise the soil and help with drainage. Um, so 10 years later, uh, Charles and Josiah are there um, and they dug into the ground and they discovered that the lime and cinders that the farmers had put on the surface uh, were now about three inches below the surface um, after 10 years had passed. Um, and obviously this, this phenomenon wasn't new. Uh, the farmers knew that this happened, um, but they just thought it was down to... Um, the, sub the substances that they put on the surface just working their way through the soil. Um, but Darwin and his uncle kind of didn't accept that and they started to question it and, and sort of said, well, these things can't just work their way through the soil. There must be something else happening in the soil um, that's causing these, causing these substances to, to work down and sink into the soil. Uh, they also observed in this field that there were lots of um, casts, earthworm casts on the surface. Um, so these are earthworm poos on the surface of the field. Um, and so from that, they that kind of told them that there must be lots of earthworms living in this in the soil in this field uh, and a lot of activity. And so maybe um, all of these earthworms that are moving around and digesting the soil, maybe it's them that are causing um, these substances to sink through the soil. So Darwin wrote a paper um, about that, which he presented to the Geological um, Society uh, in November 1837. Uh, and he was basically laughed at and ridiculed out of the, um, out of the society. Um, and the other scientists just couldn't accept that such kind of lowly, uh, simple creatures could have such an effect on, on things sinking through the soil. Uh, so Darwin... Um, actually wrote in his book uh, later on um, that these several objections seem to me to have no weight, yet I resolved to make more observations. Um, so he kind of went away, studied earthworms for 44 years, and then came back with the evidence um, to show that earthworms are having a big effect uh, on soils. Uh, so I wanted to just think a little bit about how or like why, why did Darwin study earthworms? Um, Obviously, I haven't been able to sit down and ask him why he liked them. Um, but based on some of the reasons that I know um, people who study earthworms now, some of the reasons that they like to study them, um, and some other things that we know, know from researching Darwin, and um, come up with a few um, 
thoughts about why he might have liked studying them. Um, I think the first thing to say is that he did. He spent a lot of time studying earthworms, but he also spent a lot of time studying lots of other things. Uh, he wrote a book about volcanoes. He wrote a book about barnacles. He wrote a book about carnivorous plants. Um, so it wasn't just earthworms. He did study lots and lots of different different things. Um, earthworms are ecologically important, and I think that's a great reason to study them. Um, Darwin was also really interested in their intelligence and consciousness, um, and he actually wrote in his book, uh, I became interested in them and wished to learn how far they acted consciously and how much mental power they displayed. Um, so he was he did some experiments looking at this as well, which I'll talk about later, but he was really interested in the kind of the conscious thought and intelligence of earthworms. Uh, earthworms as well are common and widely distributed, um, so you, you have to go and actively look for them. Uh, they're not just going to fly past your window, obviously. Um, but when you do go and actively look for them and start looking under things or digging a hole, uh, they are common, they are widely distributed, they are easy to find. Uh, you don't have to sit uh, for hours and hours waiting to then not see anything like you do with some, um, some groups of animals. Um, they're also easy or were easy for him to study from home. Um, so he was able to obviously study the earthworms living in the garden. Uh, and he also collected lots and did experiments uh, inside the house with earthworms in, in various pots. Um, and after his voyage on the Beagle, um, Darwin suffered from ill health for the rest of his life. So I suspect that um, being able to study a group from home, uh, particularly from pots inside the house and not even having to go outside at all, was probably quite appealing for him um, rather than having to go off on other voyages around the world. Uh, and then certainly back in the um, kind of early and middle part of Darwin's career, he was known more as a geologist. Um, he collected lots and lots of geological specimens um, on the Beagle uh, and also in other research and wrote lots of um, books and papers about geology. Um, so I suspect as well that um, earthworms obviously have very clear links to geology with all the soil formation, um, with causing stones to sink over time, um, ploughing soil over time. Um, so there's, I suspect that that was quite interesting to him too. Uh, so one kind of uh, group or series of experiments that Darwin did was looking at their senses. Um, and so this was, he collected earthworms from his garden at Down House, um, had them living in pots inside the house. And he was really keen to, um, to see kind of how they sensed the world um, and did lots of experiments, particularly looking at hearing. Um, so he played uh, lots of musical instruments to the earthworms and wanted to see if they responded in any way. Um, so he whistled, uh, blew a whistle at them, played the piano, shouted at them, and basically they didn't respond. Uh, so he concluded that earthworms um, can't hear uh, and they can't detect uh, vibrations traveling through the air. Uh, but when he then put the pots of earthworms on top of the piano and played the piano, they did uh, respond and they kind of instantly retreated into their burrows. Um, and so from this, he concluded, whilst they can't detect vibrations in the air, they can't hear, uh, they can feel vibrations traveling through the soil or through the substrate that they're in um, and they can can respond to that. Uh, he also did lots of experiments looking at earthworm burrows. Um, so this picture on the right um, shows the entrance to an earthworm burrow. Um, should just say different, there are, there are lots of different species of earthworm uh, and different species of earthworms do slightly different things and live in slightly different places. Um, so not all earthworms make burrows, um, but a lot of them do. Um, so he, um, at, when earthworms make burrows as well, um, they will often um, kind of plug the entrance to the burrow. So they'll drag leaves and twigs um, and bits of uh, basically anything that's around that they can find, and they will drag that into the entrance of the burrow to help kind of seal it up. Um, and Darwin hypothesized that they might be doing this to try and keep water out, stop the burrow flooding. Uh, they might be doing it as protection from predators, and they might also be doing it to keep cold air out. Um, and so he again did some experiments with earthworms uh, in pots, some of them outside uh, and some of them people inside uh, into warmer temperature. 
Uh, and the ones that were inside, he found, um, didn't plug their burrows as well as the ones from outside. Um, so from that, he he particularly favoured the um, the reason for them plugging their burrows uh, is to keep out the cold air. Uh, he then uh, investigated this a little bit further uh, and looked at how earthworms um, how they how they plug their burrows and how they pull these leaves into their burrows. Um, so looking at uh, leaves. Uh, in the garden and um, that had been pulled into earthworm burrows um he he basically went round uh finding earthworm burrows and pulling the leaves out of the burrows and then recording what way they'd been pulled in uh, and he pulled out 227 leaves from burrows so these poor earthworms had to keep keep plugging their burrows each night again um and he found that over 80 percent of the earthworms had pulled in um the leaves using the tip of the leaf uh, rather than the base or the middle. Um, and then Darwin kind of created his own uh, burrow um, at, at home. So he had like a small um, pipe uh, and he practiced pulling leaves into this into this pipe uh, and uh, also uh, confirmed that the easiest and most efficient way of pulling the leaf into the pipe uh, and getting it to kind of seal the seal the entrance nicely was to do it by the tip because as you start to pull the tip of the leaf into the pipe it then kind of curls around uh, and seals the entrance nicely uh, so the uh, the earthworms as well were also doing the same thing pulling it in by the tip um, and over 80 percent of the leaves were pulled in pulled in that way so that led him to conclude that chance does not determine the manner in which the leaves are dragged into the burrows. There's clearly something else going on. Uh, the earthworms know to pull them in by the tip. Uh, so he took this experiment a step further um, and made some paper triangles, which uh, mimic leaves. Uh, and he uh, hypothesized that there's basically three ways that you can pull a paper triangle um, into your burrow. Uh, you could do it using the flat surface of the triangle, you could do it using the edge, uh, or you could do it by grabbing a corner and pulling that into the burrow. Uh, and then he um, divided his triangles into three sections. So you've got a top section, a middle section, and a bottom section. Uh, and he said that if the earthworms are just using chance, just grabbing any kind of randomly anywhere on the triangle and pulling it into the burrow, then you'd expect the majority of triangles to be pulled into the burrow uh, from the bottom section. And that's because it's got the biggest flat surface area. Um, it's the section with the longest edge. And it's also got two corners in that section, whereas the middle section doesn't have any corners. The top section has one corner. Um, so if it's just probability and chance, you'd expect the majority of triangles to be pulled into burrows from the bottom section. Uh, so he then went back out into the garden um, found an area with lots of earthworm burrows again, uh, pulled all the leaves and plugs out of the burrows, poor earthworms are working hard here, uh, removed all of these leaves uh, and also removed uh, all of the leaves and any natural things that were on the ground that earthworms could have used as a plug. Uh, and then he laid out hundreds of these paper triangles uh, on, the, on the surface of the ground uh, and left them for a couple of nights and then went back and observed um, how they'd been pulled into the burrows. Um, and uh, around 60% of the paper triangles um, had been pulled into the burrows using the tip um, to the top corner. Um, so again, really highlighting that it's not um, chance that's pulling them in because you would expect it to be uh, the, the bottom section of the triangle. Um, it's there's some sort of it's basically it's not chance the earthworms are doing something else um, in, in order to make the decision as to how to how to pull the triangle into the burrow. Uh, and from that he concluded that worms, although standing low in the scale of organisation, uh, must possess some degree of intelligence. Uh, so he then wanted to see uh, whether this behavior could be adapted um, if if the shape of the leaves changed. Um, so using rhododendron leaves, um, which obviously not native to the UK, so the earthworms can't have evolved alongside those leaves to kind of know how to pull them into the burrow. Um, he again practiced with a rhododendron leaf on his own burrow or pipe, 
Uh, and for this shape of leaf, he found that actually pulling it in by the stalk is the best uh, and most efficient method. Uh, whereas for the native leaves, you pull them in by the tip. For the rhododendron leaf, it's best to pull it in by the stalk. Um, and so uh, similar to the paper triangles uh, with the worms, he cleared all the other um, litter and things on the ground that they could use uh, and replaced it all with rhododendron leaves. Uh, and again, found uh, that the worms judged with a considerable degree of correctness how best to draw the withered leaves of this foreign plant into their burrows, notwithstanding that they had to depart from their usual habit of avoiding the stalk. Um, so he then realised that the earthworms are able to adapt to their environment. They can adapt their behaviour depending on the shape of the leaf. Um, so it can't be an instinctive behaviour because instinctive behaviours um, animals won't adapt um, if the environment changes. Um, he questioned whether it could be down to trial and error. So are the earthworms just kind of randomly grabbing any part of the leaf or the paper triangle? And if that doesn't work, they move and, and try another part. Um, but he admitted that he'd never seen an earthworm do that. Um, he'd never seen them work by trial and error. And also um, the paper triangles particularly showed, you could see where the earthworm had grabbed it and, and they didn't show any evidence of, of trial and error being used. Uh, another kind of series of experiments um, that he did were looking at um, sinking stones. Um, so this links back more to his um, the first paper that he published in 1837, um, looking at um, how stones sink through the ground um, and, and how earthworms are causing that to happen. Uh, and so he went to um, Leith Hill Place, uh, which is in Surrey, um, which was some of his family lived there. Um, and 35 years before he visited, uh, an old lime kiln had been pulled down. And so there were some big uh, rocks that had just been left um, on the surface of the ground. Um, so 35 years after that's happened, uh, Darwin visits um, and he observes that the ground around the rock kind of rises up for, to meet the edge of the stone. Um, and he also observed that there were lots of earthworm casts uh, in this in the ground that's rising up, um, suggesting that there's lots of earthworms living in there, coming up and casting on the surface. Um, and he observed that this is rising up um, by four inches. Um, so it's quite a quite a steep kind of rise up the side of the rock. Uh, and that the stone had sunk one and a half inches um, into the ground uh, during the 35 years. Um, and so what's happening is the earthworms are living in the soil underneath the rock. Uh, and those that cast on the surface, so not all earthworms cast on the surface, but some species do. Um, so those that are cast on the surface come up, they try to do their cast, uh, but there's a stone in the way. So they move to the edge and do their cast around the edge of the stone. And that's causing the um, the soil to kind of rise up in a, in a little hill slope uh, next to the stone. Uh, and then as that keeps happening and soil keeps being moved around, earthworms keep burrowing underneath. Um, the weight of the stone uh, eventually causes those burrows to collapse. And so it gradually sinks into the ground. Uh, so Darwin calculated that um, if it continued sinking at the rate that he had seen, so one and a half inches in 35 years, um, that after 247 years, um, which takes us to about the year 2100, um, the whole stone should be level with the surface. Um, so a couple of years ago, back in COVID, um, I bought a new bike and got into cycling and there wasn't much to do because it was COVID. So I went for a bike ride to Leith Hill Place one day uh, and found um, Darwin's stone. Uh, so this picture uh, I took um, about 170 years after Darwin was there um, drawing this diagram. Uh, and you can see that whilst the stone isn't buried yet, um, it is a lot further sunken into the ground than it was when Darwin was there. Um, and I suspect by the year 2100, it may well be um, completely buried. Uh, he also did lots of um, experiments uh, trying to work out how much um, soil is brought to the surface by earthworms. Um, so because the other scientists at the Geological Society had kind of ridiculed him for um, suggesting that earthworms are causing things to sink, 
he um, thought that if he could prove how much soil they're bringing to the surface, because that's something you can see, uh, he might be more believed. Um, so, as I said earlier, some some earthworm species cast on the surface uh, and they basically do these nice big poos on the surface. Um, and that is uh, soil that they've eaten, digested, um, but quite often it's coming from much lower down in the, in the soil profile. Um, so Darwin got his uh, niece um, at Leith Hill Place to basically collect uh, all of the earthworm casts that were cast on the surface of the soil uh, in one square yard for a year. Um, and they so they collected all of the casts, um, dried out the soil and then weighed it. Um, and she collected 3.4 kilograms um, of soil uh, from one square yard in one year. Um, they deliberately chose um, an area that didn't, that was kind of quite average. So it didn't appear particularly good or bad for earthworms, um, just a kind of standard square yard uh, on grassland, uh, on common land near Leith Hill. Um, if you um, scale that up, so 3.4 kilograms um, is just over 16 tonnes per acre. So it's a lot of soil that earthworms are bringing to the surface uh, just in a year, just over 16 tonnes. Um, and then he wanted to know how much, um, if you kind of spread that out evenly across the surface, how thick that layer of soil would be. Uh, and he worked out that it would be 0.15 inches, um, which obviously doesn't sound like lots. Um, but when you scale that up uh, just in 10 years, that's one and a half inches or 3.8 centimetres. Um, and obviously 10 years in the grand scheme of life uh, and geology and the history of the world uh, and earthworms uh, is, is absolutely nothing. And um, so earthworms really are having a massive impact um, on, on soils, uh, just in terms of the amount of soil they're bringing to the surface. Um, it's not, earthworms are not kind of, so they're bringing this soil to the surface, but they're also removing it from below. Um, so don't kind of think that the ground is growing, if you like. Um, by 3.8 centimetres every 10 years um, because they are bringing it to the surface, but they're also taking other things back down. Um, so they're really acting as nature's plough, um, taking things from the surface deeper down into the soil uh, and bringing soils from deeper down up to the surface. Uh, so all of those um, experiments and many, many more that I haven't um, got time to talk about, um, Darwin wrote up. Uh, into into this book, which he gave the very catchy title, The Formation of Vegetable Mould Through the Action of Worms with Observations on the Habits. Uh, and he published that in 1881. He admitted at the time uh, and actually um, wrote to um, the publisher that it, it might not be that popular. Um, and he, he sent a letter to them saying, here is a work which has occupied me for many years and interested me much. I fear the subject will not interest the public, but will you publish it for me? Uh, luckily, they did. Uh, and it was really popular. It sold three and a half thousand copies just in the first two months. Um, at the time, uh, this way outsold The Origin of Species, which is obviously he's, he's more uh, kind of known for now. Um, but his book on worms was much more popular um, during his lifetime. Uh, it is the kind of the first book um, about earthworms, um, really dedicated to them and to their biology and ecology. Um, but it was also really important and contributed to the fields of invertebrate ecology more widely, uh, geology, obviously, um, behavioural ecology. Uh, not many people were really studying animal behaviour, particularly in invertebrates back then. Uh, and also statistics. Um, so... This, the mathematical discipline of statistics didn't really exist at the time. Um, and these were some of the first experiments um, ever kind of done where, um, where there was an actual kind of experimental method um, that could be repeated uh, and data was kind of built up. Um, up until then, most scientists, uh, particularly in the kind of natural history field, um, were just observing and kind of writing down their observations, not actually doing um, repeatable experiments. Um, finally, I can't do a talk about Darwin uh, and earthworms without mentioning Darwin's wormstone. Uh, so if you Google Darwin and earthworms, you'll very quickly find um, a picture like this online. 
um, of his worm stain. Um, and this was a um, study that he worked on with his son, Horace, um, who was a civil engineer. And they wanted to um, further investigate uh, uh, the effects that earthworms are having on sinking stones uh, and devise a way of being able to accurately measure this. Um, and then it was hoped that that would be able to um, help builders and civil engineers and, and, and people kind of yeah, building buildings. Um, so they, um, they put these two rods into the ground um, and these two rods go all the way through the soil um, down to the bottom of the soil layer and kind of sit on the clay, la clay layer. Uh, so this was about two and a half metres. Um, they're going down through the soil in this case. Uh, and then they put the millstone over the top. Uh, and then Horace invented this apparatus um, on the left. And the idea is that that stands on top of the stone uh, and accurately measures the uh, distance between the top of the rods uh, and the top of the stone. Uh, and then as the stone sinks through the ground, um, you can accurately measure how that changes because the top of the rods will stay in the same position. So you can measure the stone sinking accurately over time. Uh, they also uh, measured uh, rainfall um, or dampness of the ground. So that's shown in this graph um, as the top line. Uh, and actually, they found that the stone was affected so much by rainfall and by the dampness of the ground. Um, and so actually, you can't, unfortunately, uh, measure um, accurately how quickly or how much a stone is sinking due to the action of earthworms and um, because there's so many other factors particularly rainfall and dampness of the ground that are, that are in play. Uh, so what's happened uh, since Darwin? Uh, so in the uh, 1890s uh, to 1930s um, Hildrick Friend who was a minister um, traveled all around Britain uh, and did lots of earthworm recording uh, so he made lots of observations of species and locations where he found earthworms. Um, and that hasn't been done or hadn't been done before that uh, and hasn't been done all that much since uh, until much more recently. Uh, in 1947, uh, Sinospitov and Evans, uh, who were uh, two earthworm scientists working at the Natural History Museum in London, uh, they published a synopsis of Lombricidae uh, with a key to the common species. So this is the first time um, a kind of formal um, identification key to um, earthworms had been published. Uh, and then in the 1970s, um, Bush described these four ecological categories, um, which are a little bit debated now, um, but help kind of understand what niche and what role earthworms are playing. <laughs> Uh, in 2009, the Earthworm Society of Britain was founded, uh, and we're a completely volunteer-led society uh, with the aim of furthering the understanding of earthworms in the UK. Uh, and then in 2014, uh, we officially launched the National Earthworm Recording Scheme. Um, and I know Kieran's done talks on that before. Um, so we are we're basically working to... Uh, find out what species of earthworm live where, um, because we have very little data um, on on that. <laughs> um, Kevin Butt, who's an earthworm scientist who works at the University of Central Lancashire, um, has been back to Downhouse um, since Darwin uh, and has tried recreating um, some of the experiments looking at um, stones sinking into the ground uh, and so this is an experiment that's still ongoing now um, it was set up in 2007 uh, they laid these flints um, on the ground and uh, went back after six years and photographed them so you can see in the middle picture and um, that's a photo taken from the exact same position of of the other photos uh, you can see after six years the stones have start, started to sink into the ground uh, and after 10 years um they're they're sinking quite a lot more um, Uh, and then um, there have been lots of other scientists um, since Darwin who have looked at um, or tried to kind of um, build on the intelligence and the learning experiments um, that Darwin did. So there's lots of scientists who have done these lab experiments um, putting earthworms into a tea maze. Um, so they basically put the earthworm in this central um, kind of tube here 
um, it crawls to the end to this T junction, and then it has a choice of going one of two ways. Uh, if it turns left, it comes into its home chamber uh, and it's happy. That's home. That's food. That's good. If it turns right, it gets punished. Uh, and depending on the exact experiment, and so lots of different scientists have done this, but depending on the exact experiment, that could be um, a mild electric shock. It might be a chemical that's not very nice, um, but something something bad. Um, and so when you first start doing this with an earthworm, obviously it's kind of 50-50 as to which way it will go. Um, but they then repeat this experiment lots of times with the same individual earthworm. Uh, and eventually they do learn uh, to turn left and go into the home chamber. Um, so there is now lots of evidence um, that earthworms do have some capacity to learn. Um, uh, so that brings me to the end of the talk. So I've gone over slightly on time. Um, how you can find out more information uh, is read the book. Uh, so Darwin's book, even though it doesn't have a very catchy title, um, it is much shorter and much kind of lighter and easier to read than a lot of his other books. Um, I think Kieran or Rachel will be putting links to links to these in the chat now. Um, the Earthworm book and also all of other uh, all of Darwin's other publications, um, because they're all over a hundred years old, they're out of copyright. So you can download free PDF versions online, um, and they can be found at darwinonline.org.uk. Uh, the Darwin Project is a Darwin correspondence project from the University of Cambridge, um, and so they've basically digitized all of um, Darwin's correspondence, all of his letters. Um, and a lot of the um, kind of exact results of the earthworm experiments um, are actually re reported in letters um, because he was getting his uh, sons and nieces and various family members to do a lot of the research for him. They were then writing to him with the results. Uh, you can find out lots more information about earthworms uh, in general from the Earthworm Society of Britain website. Uh, you can also join us. Uh, it's only £5 for an annual membership, £40 for life membership, so it's a bargain. Uh, and then I know Kieran's got um, lots of earthworm sampling and study days coming up um, with the Biological Recording Company as well. Um, so if you're interested in getting out into the field uh, and seeing, um, collecting earthworms and being involved in a in a very uh, modern a new scientific project, um, then, then you can go uh, to some of those. Uh, and that's the end of the talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>